So there he was, all alone. He was discouraged, down and out. Some might even say depressed. Came into the worship center at his church's location, his sanctuary, if you will. Knelt down at the cross. Didn't even turn the lights on. Just knelt down, and the tears began to pour. He had just been pastor there for a couple months, and things were much bleaker than he realized. As he opened the books and he started to look at things, he just poured out his heart at the altar. The only prayer he could think of to pray was words like, God, we can't do this. This is not happening. This isn't working. You are going to have to do something so great, so big, or we will be one of that statistic of 5,000 churches that closes its doors every year. Frankly, I'm tired. The pastor said he can't do it anymore. He is done. He had just come from his financial administrator's office from the previous, it was a Monday morning, a previous Sunday, and he'd received the, the news about the tithes and the offerings and another family upset, whatever. People had left. And the pastor said that it was just like a dagger to his heart when he looked and he saw that it's not any better than the week before or the week before that. Well, the week before that, or frankly, he was learning the months before that. So he poured out his heart to the Lord, and he sat down at his office computer, and apparently he typed up an email that he was dreading, but he kind of thought it was coming, and he had to email the landlord of the space that the church was leasing and send a humiliating email that said, Sir, I am so sorry and embarrassed to tell you that our church can no longer meet the obligations that we have agreed to and we've signed up for, and we won't be able to make rent. After he sent that email, he said he noticed a stack of bills, and he began to go through them, and he had already canceled everything. There was no way to pay them, and he thought, is there some way, maybe, just hopefully, we could rob Peter to pay Paul just one more week, just one more time, right? Right? The only problem was, how many times can you rob Peter? I mean, before Peter gets wise, he's like, stop. What are you doing? He'd rob Peter so many times, Peter knew him by name. And as he, as he looked at this, his heart sank when it dawned on him that this was the week payroll was supposed to go out. And if you've ever dealt with payroll processing, like ADP, they, they don't wait for Friday to dip into your bank account. They begin that digital handshake like on Tuesday, and they start probing to see if there's anything in there. And it wasn't. So he pulled up for the first time ever the roster of his whole staff, and his heart sank. He said, how do you determine who doesn't get paid? They've all worked hard, every one of them. Even if they were part-time and the pastor was the only full-time person that actually depended solely on this, he knew every single one of them had worked hard. How do you tell them, I'm so sorry we failed, you're not getting paid? Well, the truth was he couldn't tell them that. So he picked up the phone and he called the processor, the data processor, the payment, ADP, and he said, pay everybody, but hold my check. Don't pay anybody. Or pay everybody, but just don't pay me. Don't say anything to anybody. Don't call the financial secretary. Just hold mine for these next two weeks. In fact, why don't we go ahead and hold it for the month and see if maybe there's some miracle. He was fighting back tears on the phone and, and to hear the pastor share this last week in front of a hundred other pastors being so transparent. It was amazing. You could hear a pin drop. But the thing that was the hardest of all those conversations was the next phone call. The pastor had to pick up the phone and call his wife and say, don't make the mortgage payment. Do you know a good bankruptcy attorney? And I'm so sorry that I'm a failure. And I can't even provide the basics for you. That was the opening conversation last week at the pastor's conference. I was very transparent, very open, and I share with them the truth that that pastor was me, and this church was our church. And that was us six years ago. And then I told them, guys, I want to show you the power of God. I want to show you what happens, because it was bleak. It was dark. We didn't know. We, we were on a path to be another one of those statistics, Five to 6,000 churches every year closing their doors. We couldn't see the light at the end of the proverbial tunnel. 
It was tough. Those closest knew that. Man, it was, it was, it was a struggle. You know, we sought the Lord. We poured our hearts out at the altar. We sought good counseling. We, we had some, some pastor friends mentor us and share with us and pour into us. We got a, went to therapy. In fact, here's an actual photo of my therapy dog after I shared all of my problems with it. This is, here he is. Maybe some of you have used that same therapy dog. And I shared with those pastors. I said, guys, I want you to hear something. God is on the move, and the church of the living God isn't going anywhere. And those pastors, some of them were so discouraged. What a difference five or six years make. The situation that God has us in today is so much different because you have been faithful, because he is faithful. And that's what we're talking about today. I want you to hear the bride of Christ, the church of the living God, isn't going anywhere. In fact, he is pouring out his favor on a remnant that is rising. And some of you sense it. Some of you can feel the swell and the spiritual warfare. You can feel a shifting in the atmosphere that God is up to something huge. I don't know about you. I want to be a part of it. That these next two weeks, today and especially next Sunday, I'm going to share what the next five-year vision looks like. And I have never, never been more excited. More, I'm about to jump out of my skin to see. And you're going to hear what your part can be in it. And it is awesome. So if you're ready, we're going to look at well, why the church started. It's in Matthew 16. Go ahead and pull up your Bible. Matthew 16. We're going to be in the NLT today. Let me welcome our online campus. If you're out of town, you can't be with us. We're so glad that we can at least connect that way. Chime in and let us know you're here. We're going to be in Matthew 16, starting in verse 13 through verse 18. And you're going to see the excitement level just skyrocket through what Jesus is about to do. All right, starting in verse 13, he says this. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, others say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. And then he asked them, what about you, right? Who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, you are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my father in heaven has revealed this to you. You didn't learn this from any human being. And now I say to you, that you're Peter. He's changing his name right here, which means rock. And upon this rock, I will build my church, and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. I love that. Another translation says, upon this rock, I am putting together my church, a church so expansive with energy that not even the gates of hell will be able to keep it out. Isn't that awesome? One of the reasons I love the Lord's church is because it is the one and only redemptive institution that he has placed on this planet. Did you know that? Did you ever think about that? It is the only institution on the planet designed to redeem. Think about this. It was to the church that Jesus gave us the Great Commission. Go ye therefore and make disciples into all nations, right? He gave that to the church. It's through the church that Jesus brings the message of salvation to the world. It's for the church that Jesus is coming back and will one day return. And it is Christ's church that we are committed to until that day. Never forget, no matter how bleak it looks, no matter what you see in the stats, God's church, his true church, will stand because he promised the gates of hell will not prevail against it. In fact, the church, quite literally, in every sense of the word, is supernatural. It is a supernatural church. What is it? It is indestructible. What is it that makes it so supernaturally indestructible? Why, for 2,000 years, have no human been able to silence the church? Better yet, why, with Satan, all his schemes, all his demons, everything he has, why has Satan not been able to destroy the church? You know he wants to. Why is it supernaturally indestructible? You know why? Because it's God's. And it's his plan. He is coming back. His bride, the bride of Christ, he is coming back because the church he left in the meantime to be the transformer of the world. We, as the church, are supposed to be a transformed people, adopted into his family, grafted in through faith in Christ. Jesus explained this to his disciples. Now he's walking through Caesarea Philippi, and think about this. Jesus knows his days are numbered in the flesh. He knows this, but his disciples don't get this. But he knows. Now think about how would you like to know your expiration date on the planet? Would it change the way you moved? Would it change where you go, what you say, what you do? 
He knows this, but he's got this ragtag group of disciples that some of them, they don't know. I mean, you look at, be honest, it is not exactly an impressive group on the surface. And he's wondering, he's looking at these people. I'm looking through the scriptures. Is there anyone walking with him in this moment who really understands who he is? Is there anybody who really gets the mission? Because we know in just a few days, he is going to be gone. He will ascend to his father in heaven. And then it's left to us. Or in this case, this embryonic group that sometimes can't even find their way out of a wet paper bag. They're so caught up in this modern, temporary, myopic view. When will you restore? Is it today? Can I be your right-hand man? Can we go take up Romans? Can we go? Can we do those? And then in the middle of all this, he turns and says, hey, who do people say the Son of Man is? Now, that's the story you know, but what you probably don't know is the hidden gold that's right there. Because even I've missed this through the years. It's not so much what he says that I've missed. It's where he chose to say it. This is so good. This is hidden gold. Jesus chose to ask these two questions, not as an accident, in this location. Because where he chose to go, honestly, was a very creepy place. In fact, it was rumored to be haunted. It was this place that was littered with temples to idols and demonic false gods. See, there was this great mountain that rose up and it towered over the area. And the mountain was feared to be haunted and rumored to be really housing something quite sinister. This was the birthplace. A creepy cavern was up in the top where they thought the demonic god Pan, we always think of him as the little flute player where the children get lured to the, oh no, no. It was a demonic god coming from the Greek gods, a false god that did, I can't even tell you some of the disgusting, twisted things people who followed this false god would do just to try to earn its favor. All right, so you have the Greek god Pan right there. Right next to that, you see some of the Syrian Baal worshiping idols. Right there, same place, all in this one region where they have some of the most twisted, disgusting ways of worshiping. Can't even go into it because we have children here. Right next to that, Jesus sees this white carved marble Roman godhead to Caesar. So right there, do you catch what he's doing? It is not an accident that he stops there. Jesus shows up and he's standing at the epicenter of demonic false worship. Syrian, Greek, Roman, false gods are all right there. So of all places, it's not an accident. Jesus walks up, he's looking around, and he asks two very profound questions. The first one's an easy one because he kind of lets you off the hook. He says, hey... Who do people say I am? They're just kind of casually walking around. And they're quick to answer. Oh, Jeremiah, some say this, some say that. And then the next question, ooh, it's not fun because it leaves no wiggle room. He turns on his disciples and he says, okay, enough about that. What about you? Who do you say that I am? And I would imagine you could hear a pin drop. Oh, that would be if Simon Peter wasn't there. Because Simon Peter is there, and he immediately, and I love Simon for all his glorious, brash, spastic impulsiveness. He shouts out quickly, and I believe it's his deep conviction. I don't think he, he, he's faking it here. He says, you, you, you're the Messiah. You're the Christ. You are the Son of the living God. What a statement. This is so profound. He's dropping truth grenades here because he's confirming not only his work, but he's confirming the personhood of Jesus. He is God come in the flesh. This confession right here is the single most important thing for the church. Don't miss this. This confession right here is what it is. This is the prerequisite for being a member of God's family. Confessing, you are the Lord. When you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart, Jesus is who he is, who he says he is, who they raised from the dead. This is, this is what it means. This is new birth. This is why the church is indestructible, because it regenerates. You can't kill what refuses to die. And this is the church. We have his commitment. He is coming back for us. He is the only one who can redeem, the only one who can cleanse sin, the only one who can save souls. This is why we don't fear man. This is why we don't fear governments. This is why we don't fear disease. Why would we fear something when only God has the power to destroy the soul? We serve a mighty God. Think of it like this, the one who gives us salvation. Think of it like Rembrandt. We have this great painting here on the left. Rembrandt can come, slap some colors up, do whatever it is that he does, and we say, you know what? That's art. What a masterpiece. Or Shakespeare could take a piece of paper, sign his name to it, say, I wrote this sonnet, this play. Instantly, it's worth millions. And we say, oh, it's a masterwork. Or John D. Rockefeller 
He could take a little square rectangular piece of paper, sign his name to it, call it a check, and suddenly it's instantly worth millions, and we call it capital. If you continue the poetic license here, only Jesus can take a sinner and turn him into a saint. Only he has the power to redeem. Only God can do this. We call that salvation. Because of that, the church is indestructible. It is made up of gloriously flawed people who serve a flawless God, who is coming back, who loves us, who makes a great statement. After Peter makes his confession of who Jesus is, he says, okay, upon this rock, I am going to build my church, and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. This promise right here, this is what he's giving to the church. This is why the church is still active today and indestructible. It is because it has a living, breathing, dynamic relationship to Jesus himself. Do you? Are you part of that? Do you understand what this is? See, the church is not an organization. The church is an organism. It is living. It is breathing. So here's the three truths I want you to take with you today. The first one, notice this. The church is built on Christ. Don't miss that. It's not built on me. It's not built on Peter. It's not built on a pope. Jesus is saying, upon this rock, I will build my church. And here we have that great, almost humorous play on words. Don't miss what Jesus is saying. In the original Koine Greek, he uses the word petros. You are petros. Okay, you know what that means? It means a small pebble, a little stone. But then he changes his name, and he totally goes back, and he says, from here upon this rock, but he doesn't use that word. He uses petra, a totally different word. It means gigantic boulder or a foundation cornerstone. So the rock on which the church is built is the person of Christ himself. He is the founder. He is the cornerstone, the son of God. Not Peter. The church is built on the founder. And Peter himself confirmed this and told us that. He said, Jesus is the chief cornerstone. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 3.11, there is no other foundation for the church that can be laid except Jesus Christ. If you are part of any other faith or denomination that says anything, it is anathema. It is wrong. Jesus is the foundation. He is the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. 1 Peter 2.5 even tells us, you are placed as living stones. You are now in, you are building up. You are becoming a living temple where your service can be acceptable to God. So to my friends, and I have many of them who think that this only applies to Peter, you are missing what Jesus is doing here. Jesus is saying he's not building an indestructible church on a new pope. He's not building it on a man. It's not about Peter. It's about Peter's confession. You are the Christ. You are the Savior. You are the Son of the living God. And Jesus is like, right you are, good sir. In fact, on this confession, I am now going to build the indestructible church. And the gates of hell will never be able to overcome it. And 2,000 years later, we stand on that. So not only is the church built on Christ, but the church is built by Christ don't miss that. It's not me. It's not even you. 2,000 years ago, Jesus began calling this ragtag group that we call the disciples, the beginning of the army. He walked the shores of Galilee. If you've been following the chosen, then you recognize some of these people right away. He calls forth first that hot-headed fisherman, spastic Peter. Oh, I love Peter. Put away your sword, Peter. It's not about that. James, John, Andrew. He even saves a wascally guy named Matthew who's a despised, hated tax collector. He worked for the IRS and the government, and his name was Matt. I mean, can you trust anybody with a name like that? He goes on to save zealots, and then he branches out. He starts including women. He discovers a woman at the well, gives her new life, and tells her, hey, you found the water of life. And people start going and telling others. What was he doing? He's building his church. He's building the very first church. And then dramatically, as if to remind people, he turns to his disciples and he says in John 15, 16, oh, by the way, you didn't choose me. I chose you. I chose you for a reason. I chose, oh, I know where this is going. You're about to. I chose you to bear fruit. I chose you to bear lasting fruit. Okay, so hear me. You are not here today by accident. You are not here today by random happenstance or choice or luck. You are here today in this moment, just like Jesus chose Peter, Andrew, James, John, all those. He chose you. He saved you. He has placed you in his church so that you can serve him and bear fruit. So you know I got to ask. <laughs> Don't hate me. I'm just your friendly neighborhood pastor. How are you doing with that? Are you bearing fruit? Are you advancing the kingdom in Anyway, 
or do you have room to improve? If you do, it's okay. We all do. When you hear what this church is about to do next week and a little bit today, your eyes are going to be open to see what bearing fruit looks like. You see, the tree is meant to produce fruit. Let me see this right here. This is, this is a beautiful example. Have you ever thought about that? The tree is the only one that doesn't get to enjoy its own fruit. Did you know that? The true, it bears fruit, but it's for everyone else. Even the fruit that goes bad or falls to the ground, even the nasty little ants and spiders get to eat it. But the good fruit gets picked, and guess what? They get to share it. They get to go out and whoo, and it's for other people. You got it? Oh, yeah, look alive. You want one? All right, All right, Mimi, got it? Hayden? You get to share the fruit, and guess what? The tree is doing its purpose and it's happy. In fact, these are happy trees. These are the ones who begin to go out and do what they're meant to do. They bring joy to others because it is what they did. Remember, the tree doesn't enjoy its own fruit. And just like that, the church is the only organization on the planet that exists for the people who are not yet in the room. Ooh. Well, pastor, I thought it was about us. I thought it was inward focus. That's not a New Testament church. We were given the great mandate Go ye therefore and make disciples. He didn't even say go make converts. What? He said go and make disciples. Well, that's a whole different level of depth. That's a whole different level of fruit. So when you think about this, they're happy because they're fulfilling their purpose. Are you unhappy because you are not fulfilling your purpose? See, the good news is it's supposed to multiply. Wait till you hear what we are going to do next week. The church is built on Christ, it's built by Christ, and the last thing I want to leave you with, the church is built through Christ. In other words, the church is successful only because of his power. It's not on me, it's not on your shoulders, it is his church, and he will build it. He made the promise, all the powers of hell will not conquer it. Now, there's two ways of looking at this statement. Most people choose the wrong one. And I'll be honest, the church in America has chosen the wrong one far too long. Permission to be very candid with you this morning. Granted? Okay, if not, plug your ears, or walk out, turn off TV, whatever you need to do. The wrong way is this. Some people understand that the meaning of the church should be almost like an exclusive club, like a clique, where we come in, we link arms, and we lock it down like a fortress. And all the hell, uh, all the force of hell are, are, are raging all around us like a battle. I can hear the mortar shells and people are landing, and we're like, hunker down, it's going to be okay. Circle the wagons. If we could just survive, if we could just be safe above all other things, uh-huh, then maybe we can just hold out long enough for Jesus will come back and take us back. But I'll lean in, put your helmets on, put your bubble wrap on, let's get super safe, and Jesus, he's coming, we're just going to hold our breath, and he's going to come again. That is so unbiblical. That is nothing what the New Testament. The truth is, it's just the opposite. The church is supposed to be the one storming the gates of hell. That's what Jesus is talking about. As the church carries out its evangelistic mission, we share the good news. We're actually knocking on the gates of hell. We are tearing them down. The church lives out the gospel. We snatch people from the flames. We snatch people from a life without purpose, without passion, without joy, addiction, and all these things start to come in because they're searching for something that only God could fill. And we know the truth, and we sit on it. We hide it. So hear me. The song, the theme of the church for a lost and dying world should not be hold the fort, y'all. The theme song for the church shouldn't be hunker down. We're almost there. It should be onward Christian soldiers where we move forward. All the doom and gloom that you hear, hear me. The church of the living God is alive and well. There is no expiration date. Do you know what does have an expiration date? Death. Evil. That has an expiration date. In fact, we even know when and how it happens. Over in Revelation 2014, it tells us that death and hell are literally taken and the Lord throws them into the lake of fire to be forever dealt with. No more crying. No more pain. No more tears. No more suffering. We know that. We have the good news. So my question for us today, Potter's Hand, when we look at the, the landscape and the war that we have, are we in retreat against the enemy? Or are we invading his territory? Because I don't know about you, I am tired of playing defense. 
I want us to be on offense. God's church is called to be on offense. Y'all, we have the football. We have the good news. We're the ones who have been given this great message. Say, hey, God loves you. He wants to restore a relationship with you. He wants to give you forgiveness of sin, purpose, passion, peace, guilt-free living. He wants all of this. There is purpose for your life. We have the football. The indestructible church is called to always be on offense. We were never called to go hide out and and just play defense, huddle the ball, and, and run out the clock. But that's what so many churches have done. They've turned inward. What the church has been doing the last 40 years isn't working. More and more people are dying and going into eternity not knowing the saving grace that we claim to know. Have you thought about that? That should break our hearts. God never said, okay, upon this rock, I'm going to build my kingdom, and I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom, and what you bind in heaven will be bound on earth, and what you loose will be loosed. And He never said, go take all of this and then keep it to yourself. Go hide it away, and don't tell anyone. It'll be our little secret. Go hide it under a bushel, okay? Don't tell anyone the good news. I want you just to keep it to yourself. And then one day, I'm going to come sneak away, and I'll come get you. That is so not biblical. That is not what it's about. In fact, if you look at what Jesus says, he's using words to describe you with powerful metaphors like salt and light and water and fire. Why does he do that? Do you know what they have all in common? They invade. They penetrate. Think about this. They invade. Invasion is the one common. Light invades the darkness and it disappears. Salt invades, it penetrates meat, and it's preserved. Isn't that awesome? When you think about water, it penetrates the ground. What happens? A harvest springs up. Even fire invades the room and raises the temperature of the entire crowd. Folks, that is us, he's describing. That is our mantle. That is why we are indestructible. It is God's incredible church. The church of Jesus is God's penetrating salvation force for a lost and dying world. And too long, we've hidden it under a bushel. And Jesus comes and says radical things like, I tell you the truth, if you have the faith as a mustard seed, nothing will be impossible for you. True faith. True faith in God, uh, hear me, it has nothing to do with your abilities. It has nothing to do with your talents, your financial condition. True faith in God is believing that God has the ability to do what he says he will do. Do you believe the church's best days lie ahead? In fact, let me ask this question. How committed are you to Christ and his church? How committed would you say you are? It's a question we asked the pastors last week. How committed are you all in? The church is the only indestructible institution left, and it is what God is coming back for. And he wants all to come to repentance and be a part of of the church. This is why we're committed to it. We are his adopted children. We are now his family, the people of God. So what does that look like for us at the potter's hand moving forward? Aha. Uh-huh. I'm going to have the band come up. We're going to land the plane here. We're going we're to do something a little different, okay? What does this look like for us in this strange new post-pandemic world where everybody's just weird and they're hoarding gasoline and toilet paper? What is the next step to advancing the kingdom? See, the church was never intended to be a cul-de-sac. But the church is real good at being a cul-de-sac. The church was meant to be a conduit. Did you know that? It's not meant to be a lake where we just, they're keepers of the aquarium. We're supposed to be fishers of men. What happens to a lake if it has no output? Mm -hmm. It gets rancid. Smells like an 11-year-old boy's room with dirty socks. <laughs> Hypothetical? Come on. <laughs> it stinks. There's no life. There's no growth. Hey, Milo. <laughs> There's an, I was not single, I promise. I wasn't. There's no life. It becomes rant. Look at the Dead Sea. There's no outlet. It wasn't meant to do that. It's dead. Nothing can survive it. But look at a river that gives life and it roars through the countryside and there's fish and there's life and there's spawning and there's growth and there's multiplication the way God intended it. The church was never designed to sit and be stagnant. 
We were never saved just to sit. We were saved to serve. Are you? We were saved not to sit. We were saved actually to send. Ooh. Well, Pastor, that's something we haven't really talked about much. I don't know if I'm up for that. <laughs> I hear you. Believe me. I hear you. I want us to be known not only as a generous church, which we are, not only as a friendly church, which we are, not only a church that tries to look outward and be a community center for the community, it just happens to be a church, which we are. I want us to be known as a sending church, a church that actually embraces multiplication. What do you mean by that, Pastor? Oh, <laughs> this is the exciting time in this life, not only for this church, but for the church. As I got to meet with all these other brothers and hear their stories, I am so thankful for you. I am so grateful. I cannot tell you how many times people might say, well, this struggle, we have this struggle, and we're doing this, and our people are this and that. Well, you know Pastor Matt, right? You experienced that. And I'm like, no, no. We don't deal with those kind of issues. Thankfully, God has blessed us with people who are willing to start not looking at ourselves, but to look outward, to say we are one beggar telling another beggar where we found food, not free food, but food that's already been paid for. We're no better than anyone else. We literally want you to experience forgiveness of sin, purpose, passion. We want to share that blessing. Y'all, there is an outpouring coming on churches. Not all of them. There are some that are dying, some that are already dead. There was a guy at this conference. He said, you know what? We're so over pathetically scared. We're afraid we're going to be exposed to COVID. He said, nah, I feel like the church has been exposed by COVID. There are some who have laid down their mantle and their mission, and they think someday in the future they're going to flip a switch and they will come running back, and some opened up just as, just as recently as last week, and they were shocked to see 80% of them missing in action. Why would you be surprised? You're not fulfilling the mandate God has put on your shoulders. Why would you be surprised? The church has been exposed. You know, all that fluff, all those exaggerated numbers across the country. America is the great shining city on a hill. You know they're sending missionaries to America? That hurt my feelings. You can't send them. What? We're America. You don't, we send missionaries to you. No, you guys need Jesus. And they're right. Because we have become a cul-de-sac, almost a country club mentality, where we think, let's just be attractional. Let's just be all things to all men. Let's hey. More smoke, more fog, more mirrors, more go-go dancers, more Cirque du Soleil hula hoops, more lasers. No, no. You notice what we've done? It's about Jesus. Everything in this room is designed to be simplified to where you focus right there. It's not this. It's not shiny trinkets. It's all about his mission. And God is raising up a new generation. And he just might be calling people in this room to something. Some of you have told me, you knew God has something different for you, something bigger. Some of you are in your 70s and 80s, and you still know God has plans for you. Some of you are 17 years old. There are people in, the, I am prophesying, there are people in this room that God is putting his favor and his anointing on, and he has plans for you before he returns. You know what your challenge is today? To ask, what are you going to do with the coming wave? With this, Look at this, every hair on my body is standing up. There is a coming wave, a spiritual anointing coming on his remnant. Do you want to be part of it? Do you want to be part of it? Do you want to advance the kingdom? Where we mean what we say, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I wonder if this coming wave, this outpouring of a spirit, it's already beginning to swell. How many kingdom-minded, servant-hearted leaders are already here in this room right now? Or maybe you're joining us online. So here's your challenge. Here's your homework assignment, okay? Between now and the next time we see each other, I'm going to ask you to seek the Lord and ask him one question. One question. You ready? Write it down if you need to. When you get before the Lord, ask him this simple question. Lord, what part do you want me to play? That's it. I'm done playing games. I'm done with cultural Christianity. Lukewarm Christianity ain't going to cut it. That's gone. That's gone. All those fringe attenders, all those loosely committed people, they're gone. You know what's left? <laughs> the army. The ones you can go to war with. Look at this. This room is packed. 
with people who could be anywhere today and you chose to be here in his house on his day honoring him. It's sad that there's traffic every day of the week except Sunday morning. Oh, I'm sorry. There's traffic taking the boat to the lake. I forgot about that. There's traffic at Sheets waiting to get gas. Don't you want to be fired up for something that matters? When I look at this and I see what God is doing and I say, God, I'm laying, I'm taking this challenge, I'm opening my hands literally in front of you and say, what part do you want me to play? I don't want to miss it. I'm reminded of Isaiah 6, where Isaiah is looking around and he hears the Lord saying, who's going to take the message to the people? And he says, here am I, send me. So in these coming days, I'm going to share with you exactly how you can join in and advance the kingdom, real practical things you can do. Today, your goal is simply to seek him and decide are you even available? Because as for me and my house, we are. We are all in. And I imagine, looking at this room, I'm not the only one. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to pray. We're going to open the altar. Some of you may want to pray that prayer today. You may want to come. No one will bother you. Maybe there's a lost person in your family and your heart just aches for them. Come lay their name before the Father. Maybe you've got a neighbor who needs to know Jesus. Maybe you've got an upcoming health crisis or a job situation. Come pour your heart out to list the highlight of our week where we sing one last song. We close it down with a, an altar call. Just be obedient. Let me pray for you. God, I thank you for your spirit in this place. I thank you for this time where we can come before you, our Abba Father. Pour out our hearts to you, knowing that you care for us. What a privilege. Holy Spirit, speak to us today. Help us to be obedient to wherever you're leading. That is our simple prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.